The late economist Milton Friedman was one of the boldest and most provocative figures of our time. He was born in 1912, making this the 100th anniversary of his birth. Milton Friedman received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976, and as a professor at the University of Chicago, he transformed a generation of economists. It's safe to say his work influenced the entire field. He was an author and an advisor to several presidents. His ideas won him millions of advocates and opponents all over the world. While some place a greater emphasis on financial equality, Friedman advocated economic liberty. In 1980, he shared his ideas with millions of TV viewers in the landmark PBS series, Free to Choose. Hi, I'm Emily Rooney, and here, surrounded by images of the University of Chicago, Milton's intellectual home, we'll engage four distinguished guests in a discussion of the relevance of Friedman's ideas today. Major funding was provided by CME Group. For more than 160 years, through continuous innovation in trading and technology, CME Group products have provided businesses with the opportunity to manage risk amid the changing financial landscape. BP is dedicated to helping meet America's energy needs. Our investments support jobs across the country and reaffirm our commitment to the U.S. that began over a century ago. Additional funding was provided by John A. Gunn and Cynthia Fry Gunn, the Melvin S. Cohen Foundation, FedEx Corporation, the Ellie Phillips Family Foundation, and Corrett Foundation. Americans are universally committed to the idea of equality, but in practice that means different things. Some think equality means little without equal outcomes. Others, like Milton Friedman, believe equality means equal treatment before the law and spoke out against government attempts to guarantee equal outcomes. He argued that only equality of opportunity would lead to freedom and prosperity. So what is equality? In his 1980 landmark series, Free to Choose, Friedman wrestled with that question in a program called Created Equal. In the next hour, we will too with our panelists. Walter Williams, a professor of economics at George Mason University. Matthew Iglesias, a fellow at the Center for American Progress. And Shika Dalmia, a senior analyst at the Reason Foundation. And John Bowman, president of the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law. So welcome to all of you. All right, well first, Milton Friedman went to Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, which vividly illustrates Jefferson's contradictions over the meaning of equality. It was Jefferson who wrote these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What he meant by the words equal can be seen in the phrase endowed by their creator. To Thomas Jefferson, all men are equal in the eyes of God. They all must be treated as individuals who have each separately a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, practice did not conform to the ideals in Jefferson's life or in ours as a nation. He agonized repeatedly during his lifetime about the conflict between the institution of slavery and the fine words of the Declaration. Yet, during his whole life, he was a slave owner. During the 19th century, and especially after the Civil War and on into the 20th century, the idea of equality came more and more to mean that everyone should have the same opportunity to make what he could of his capacities. That all careers should be open to people on the basis of their talents, independently of the race or religion or belief or social class that characterized them. This concept of equality of opportunity offers no conflict at all with the concept of freedom. On the, on the contrary, 
They reinforce one another, and it is no doubt the concept that even today is most widely held. But in the 20th century, beginning especially abroad, and at a later date in this country, a very different concept, a very different ideal has begun to emerge. That is the ideal that everyone should be equal in income, in level of living, in what he has. The idea that the economic race should be so arranged that everybody ends at the finish line at the same time, rather than that everyone starts at the beginning line at the same time. This concept raises a very serious problem for freedom. It is clearly in conflict with it, since it requires that the freedom of some be restricted in order to provide greater benefits to others. The society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. John, do you think that's true? Milton Friedman was saying that in the 1980s that our ideal was that everybody should have equal income, equal living circumstances. Do you think that's true? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think there was, uh, and I don't think the, the sort of ideal, as he calls it, of equality of outcome ever had any serious force in this country. Uh, I think mostly what people were arguing for that he might call equality of outcome is just uh, the government involvement in the guaranteeing of equal opportunity and the removal of barriers to equal opportunity. And it's where you get in that gray area between these sort of ideal extremes and where you have to actually advocate for one thing or another and develop the role of government in the guarantee of equal opportunity, that's when you start get into, you know, getting into the arguments about, about who's right or wrong about the role of government. And whether the outcome should be equal as well. Well, I, I think that the only kind, of, only kind of equality that is consistent with uh, personal liberty is equality before the law. And, but however, looking at equality of opportunity as a concept, it really just doesn't tell you very much. That is, I don't have an equal opportunity to be a great boxer. I don't have the equal opportunity to be a, a great a basketball player. And I don't have the equal opportunity to do many, many things. So I think that the only kind of equality we should be striving for is equality before the law. Well, just to respond to John's, uh, John's point, uh, I think when Milton Friedman was, uh, made this clip, uh, affirmative action was at its heyday. And affirmative action, which started off as equality of opportunity, had actually morphed into and still has morphed into something like equality of outcome. Because if you look at the admission practices of a lot of uh, you know, universities, what they are trying to do is get proportional representation by ethnic group, by you know, various different criteria. And that's because they feel unless they arrange for equal outcomes, uh, you know, it, th there's no way to measure equality of opportunity. The only way to measure equality of opportunity is through equality of outcomes. And so they have prearranged the outcomes. And I think that's the kind of mindset that Milton Friedman was, was talking about at the time. Well, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that Thomas Jefferson was invoked in this context, because Jefferson, at least as I recall it, had a, a fairly robust sort of conception of, of equal citizenship, where it was important not just for people to have a sort of formal hollow equality, but he wanted to see a society of, of sort of farmer owner practitioners. Uh, it's difficult to know, you know, what that would mean in, in the modern context, but, but the idea is that, you know, everyone needs to have access to certain kinds of economic resources to have real opportunity to be a meaningful participant in society. And not, I think, just a sort of empty legal equality. Going back to your point, though, I mean, Je Thomas Jefferson had slaves. And mm. the free market essentially created slavery. But the free market wasn't going to take that away. It wasn't going to take discrimination away. It wasn't going to take Jim Crow laws away. So without some kind of government mm. intervention, what, what, why wouldn't that have continued? Well, I, I don't think slavery is consistent with the free market. That is, the free market has something to do with private property rights and, and self-ownership. And slavery is a violation of the essential principles of uh, free markets. So slavery is more, uh, it's something like uh, for the forcible use of one person to serve the purposes of another. And that, that has to be offensive to anybody who believes in personal liberty. 
But it took it took government to fix it. The market itself right. wasn't going to fix it. It wasn't going to sell. And if you it. if you equate um, if you equate freedom, it's difficult really to understand what Friedman meant by freedom uh, here. That's a very mushy concept. Everybody gives up some freedom, right? We, we pay taxes. If you're a policeman, you submit to discipline, so you do the job well. Um, and so the, the issue isn't, is there some pure freedom, unfettered uh, life uh, that is even possible for anybody, but where are we going to draw the line? in a very pragmatic sense. There's a tension between personal freedom and the common good. And I think they're both uh, important, laudable goals. And the idea is to seek the balance there. And in the mm -hmm. question of slavery, you had to have a government role in order to bring it to an end, because the market wasn't going to do it. Do you agree with that? Well, no, I actually <laughs> think the reason we needed government to uh, get rid of discrimination and slavery was because government had created the problem in the first place. It was the government that was enforcing, even during mm -hmm. Jefferson's time, uh, you know, that uh, the, the idea of enslavement, that one person could own another person, that was a government-enforced uh, enforced institutionalization. So which is why we then had to, mm -hmm. a whole culture developed around certain government practices, which then you needed a mm -hmm. violent government action like the Civil War to get rid of. And then later on, of course, uh, it, it, you know, we still didn't have equality. We still had Jim Crow laws in this country, which required a further government step, which was the Civil Rights Act, to get rid of that. But this was a problem. Slavery was a government created and supported institution, and it had nothing really to do with well, the but free I, market. But I think, how, however, you, you construe the origin of, of the problem, it, it's still the case that the Civil Rights Act involved some significant curtailments of, of private property rights. But I would say, and I think the vast majority of people would say, that was it was good for freedom in any kind of meaningful sense. No, I don't, I don't think it was good at all. That is, I think that uh, when the Civil Rights Act was written, I think that instead the government should have said that, that the Constitution applies to all Americans and that was it. And, but however, see, see, I think one of the points that people uh, fail to take into consideration that as, as, uh, as uh, was uh, said earlier, that most of the problems that black Americans faced in our country then and now is a result of government. Its root lies with government. I don't, I don't, and you I don't disagree, you disagree. I mean, for example, if I were the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan right. and I wanted to sabotage black academic excellence, I couldn't find a better way to do than the government schools. Can you? No, but I, but I don't think the conclusion is to uh, shut down government schools or get the government out of schools. There's, the conclusion is to do a better job in schools. And, How and long have we been doing well, that? What, what about the issue of affirmative action, does it disenfranchise anyone? Milton Friedman says that you shouldn't be restricting the personal freedoms of a few to benefit others. Isn't that what affirmative action does? Essentially, I think that's exactly what it does. Now, I think, uh, you know, uh, we have affirmative action in this country, not just for people at the lower end of the strata. We have affirmative action for people at the upper end of the strata. A whole host of universities use legacy preferences, which is affirmative action for the rich. And they all, and what, again, it goes back to Milton Friedman's point that we are trying to arrange equality of outcomes because we want X number of people, you know, who are in, uh, you know, upper echelons of New England to go to Harvard and a certain number of Jews to go to Harvard. There were quotas against Jewish people in this country, uh, you yeah. know, at Harvard for a very long time. And uh, so very affirmative action know, is very much an equality of outcomes. The point of it was to create equality for originally for African Americans because of the legacy of slavery. That was the idea that it would quite give equal opportunity where there didn't, it didn't exist before. Well, was it necessary? In my view, it was not necessary. In fact, if uh, you know, uh, the Abigail Thornstrom and Stephen Thornstrom have done mm -hmm. some wonderful work in which they have actually documented how uh, black progress in universities, uh, both in terms of attendance and graduation rates, had been going up you know, quite rapidly till the 1970s when affirmative action became really big. And at that stage, actually, blacks started doing worse because they were getting into rebut that? universities <laughs> without being properly prepared. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so they were going to universities. Well, affirmative action. Affirmative action actually is a cause 
of uh, you know keeping mm -hmm. blacks back to some extent rather than their progress. Uh, you, you know, when, when we get into talking about education, though, it, you two have both very quickly sort of abandoned this first principles. You know, the government has to stay out of everything, and, and you're instead trying to mount some some empirical arguments. You're saying, well, maybe the government schools aren't very good, and maybe affirmative action didn't do what it was supposed to do. But that means that we're having a conversation which is about how do we actually equip children with what they need to have a fair chance at succeeding. Well, look at this. And that that I mean, does require, we seem to be agreeing, that some kind of meaningful shot at getting quality mm -hmm. education really matters. I think there's well, a lot of things about you know, prenatal, would, neonatal health Would you just accept nutrition. the achievement gap going forward? There's a profound achievement gap. It grows bigger and bigger every year between uh, white and Asian no, I don't American accept, students I don't and black it. and Hispanic, it's profound. I don't accept it, but I'm, that doesn't mean that affirmative action is necessary. Look, at, look at, for example, at one time, blacks were not allowed in basketball. Today, 80% of professional basketball players are black. And it didn't happen because of affirmative action. It happened because these guys could do a 360 slam dunk in your face and you couldn't do anything about it. The same thing in baseball, the same thing in football, 66%. Are, are these right. results of affirmative action? Moving on. Okay, all right. In a world where children are born into radically different circumstances, Milton Friedman wrestled with what it means to provide equal opportunity and how to best provide that. Milton? The Yehudi menu in school in the south of England is also a place of privilege. Musically talented children from all over the world compete for a chance to come here to study. Much of the moral fervor behind the drive for equality comes from the widespread belief that it is not fair that some children should have a great advantage over others simply because they happen to have wealthy parents. Of course it's not fair. But is there any distinction between the inheritance of property and the inheritance of what at first sight looks very different? These youngsters have inherited wealth, not in the form of bonds or stocks, but in the form of talent. Or look at the same issues from the point of view of the parent. If you want to give your child a special chance, there are different ways you can do it. You can buy him an education, an education that will give him skills enabling him to earn a higher income. Or you can buy him a business. Or you can leave him property, the income from which will enable him to live better. Is there any ethical difference between these three ways of using your property? Or again, if the state leaves you any money to spend over and above taxes, should you be permitted to spend it on riotous living, but not permitted to leave it to your children? The ethical issues involved are subtle and complex. They are not to be resolved by resort to such simplistic formulas as fair shares for all. Indeed, if you took that seriously, it's the youngsters with less musical skill, not those with more, who should be sent to this school in order to compensate for their inherited disadvantage. Well, he's got a lot of thoughts in that one piece, but she goes, is he saying that education is the basis of all equal opportunity? Um, I'm not sure he's saying exactly that. I think what he's saying here is that, um, you know, we all have different endowments and, uh, you know, whether they are, um, you know, inherited endowments or whether they are, you know, in terms of what our abilities are or whether they are, uh, we've inherited wealth. And what matters is not what the initial distribution is. What matters is that we allowed to be, you know, we should be allowed to do, make what we can or whatever that it, uh, initial distribution is. So here he is, you know, very much talking about again the equality of, uh, you know, opportunity to allow whatever hand uh, life has dealt us as best as we can, as opposed okay. to. 
Um, but, but I hear him saying that is it our obligation, the government's obligation, the citizenry's ob obligation to provide education first? No, he, well, what he, the, it, he, he's saying what the government's obligation is to try and make sure that we are able to use our endowments as best as we can without being prevented from other, by other people from doing so. So, you know, in feudal societies, the, the, you know, the debate in history has been how do we redistribute income according to some formula. So in feudal societies, the aristocrats had the right to uh, a, a, a extract uh, labor and therefore wealth from the serf class. And in super progressive societies, you have you know, the, the, uh, the poor or the relatively less well off trying to extract wealth from the rich. And what he's saying is that kind of society will inevitably lead to you know, a whole host of curtailments of freedom as opposed to uh, you know, uh, an equality of opportunity, I, which is what he is interested I, in. I think he was he's setting up kind of an extreme straw man in order to make an argument against the estate tax, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, which we're still having that debate right and, now. Right. And <clears throat> of course, the e equal shares, I don't think was ever a serious proposal, uh, but it's sort of an extreme way to portray an argument about the estate tax. Um, but um, I think it's perfectly consistent with notions of freedom and, and, and passing along, um, you know, a good inheritance to your children to, uh, to have an estate tax. Um, that it doesn't matter, I heard Bill Gates Sr. say once, it doesn't matter if Junior's going to get $8 million out of a $10 million estate or $6 million out of a $10 estate. He's getting a nice inheritance that he didn't earn himself and he can go off and do what he wants with it. Um, so I, it's hard for me to see exactly what point uh, Friedman was making here other than the one that we all have different gifts and fine and we should have uh, the ability to do what we can with them. Equal opportunity again. And I don't think we are, any of us are disagreeing with that. What, what, what's, what's the <clears throat> difference between bequeathing your children uh, a million or two million dollars in, in cash and bequeathing them a superior IQ or high height that that translates into uh, 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 differential advantages in the market. That is, uh, Will Chamberlain surely had greater uh, chances in the market than I did, and it, and it was bequeathed from his parents too, or whatever. Yeah. Well, well but you know, the the difference. I mean, the reason we have taxes is is to raise revenue because we can do things with the revenue, right? So, I mean, the the idea of taxing certain kinds of very large bequests is not just that we are, you know, mad at the kids who are, who are getting the money. It's that we're thinking that the money can be put to use. We can, for example, help make sure that people have schools and have education. Uh, you know, and, and that's uh, very fundamental. I mean, I think he, he seemed to indicate that it would be somehow absurd to be giving extra violin lessons to the, to the less talented children, which is a, an interesting example. But I think it's quite natural to say that, well, if some children are born blind, that we give them some extra assistance because there's an unusual difficulty there, that we need to give health care to the people who are in need of the health care rather than just hand it out equally mm -hmm. or hand it out to the people but who have the least. But he was also this suggesting. Very, very, di very important di distinction between what you just said and the conception of uh, equality, which is what you're talking about and what Milton Friedman actually conceded that when you, ha when you have people who are in distress, then you do have a responsibility <coughs> to do something about them. That's all right. What is not all right is income redistribution for its own sake because we just don't like inequality. Well, where's that His money going to come from? Where, where is it going to come from? Well, is, is it a tooth fairy or Santa Claus? Well, no, well, it's no, not. We don't, well, we don't. The, the, that's why there's The taxes. only way, see, 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 what I find pretty offensive about many of these programs is the forcible use of one person to serve the purposes of another. I think that is immoral. And, uh, well, I, and I mean, uh, uh, and unless, unless you think it's moral. And, no, uh, and to get the I word, think it's a that, concept that, of community no, that, and that, the that, 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 That's what well, slavery was. It happens all the time. forcible use of one person to serve the purpose of another. Well, no, and I, know, I find that offensive I, I think, in any degree. I think that this is the, the real concept of equality that I think is left out of this, this opportunity and, and outcome. Dichotomy is the idea that policy should take the interests of all the citizens equally seriously when you're making these things. And that means you can't put undue burdens on any particular individual. You have to let people lead their lives, but it also does mean that if arrangements can make large numbers of people better off by calling for some sacrifice, that that's a good idea, that we can build a so better world that way. So you believe that, what, what, the force, that people should be forcibly used 
to serve the purpose of others. I believe that institutions should be no, set no, up no, no. to serve Institution, the purpose. Institutions according to whom? Now, you know, we talk here about uh, distributive justice, redistributing income based on, uh, you know, poverty and uh, wealth. In Plato's Republic, he thought, uh, you know, proper idea of distributive justice would be that goods go to people who deserve them. So if you're a great piano player, mm -hmm. then you should get, you should be entitled to pianos, not if whether you are rich or poor. And that thought experiment led straight to, you know, a com extremely oppressive communist You're society. Pl Plato led straight to extremely... In his, no, his thought, that's his thought experiment years. in the Republic. No, that's his thought experiment in the Republic, which goes to Milton Friedman's point that if, you know, if you are going to be interested in questions of distributive justice, you are going to have to curtail people's freedom to such an extent that you will get a great deal of oppression. Which is, and you, and uh, the final outcome will be you will distort people's incentives to produce. But that's, but and that's what I don't understand. Equality, you know what I, wh why neither, is it that we have to wealth. leap from extreme to extreme? I mean, yeah, we're right. living in a society today which is not a communist dictatorship. It's not a, an unfree dystopia. But it also is a society that has taxes. It has programs. It has some it, social it, insurance. It has some retirement benefits. In so far as look, in so far as it doesn't make equality an end in itself, and simply means to removing certain extremes form of forms of distress that would be all right but that's not actually what happens uh, these days you know when you do, but, I mean, when you, you listen to president obama when you when you listen to when you know when you listen to president obama you know he talks about spreading the wealth for its own sake yeah. now that's a very problematic well, idea well, we are, that's, we are that's, talks about, we are talking about repression because if i say to the federal government I will pay my share of the of the constitutional constitutionally mandated functions of the federal government. I will be happily, but I will not have my earnings go to farmers, go to bail at big banks. You'll see all the intimidation, threats, and oppression Absolutely. that I would want but, to I mean, see. I think America but, America meets any any normal person's basic mm -hmm. definition of we are living in a free society here. This is not. Plato's Republic. This is not the Soviet Union. We're not living in a free society. Well, if you equate well, paying, you if you I, equate I mean, paying, paying you, if you equate paying taxes for things that the the political establishment has set up that you don't like, if you equate that to uh, involuntary servitude, then I guess you have a problem. Well, the constant, what, what, what is the constant? Right, we're going to move on to living the next in an ordered segment. society. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, Milton Friedman understood and accepted, as we were just saying, that life is unfair, that mm. some people will be born into wealth, others into poverty. But he said trying to redistribute that wealth would be unjust to those who work hard to earn their money. From Victorian novelists to modern reformers, a favorite device to stir our emotions is to contrast extremes of wealth and of poverty we are expected to conclude that the rich are responsible for the deprivations of the poor. That they are rich at the expense of the poor. Whether it is in the slums of New Delhi or in the affluence of Las Vegas, it simply isn't fair that there should be any losers. Life is unfair, there's nothing fair about one man being born blind and another man being born with sight. There's nothing fair about one man being born of a wealthy parent and one of an impecunious parent. What kind of a world would it be if everybody was an absolute identical duplicate of anybody else? You might as well destroy the whole world and just keep one specimen left for a museum. In the same way, it's unfair that Muhammad Ali should be a great fighter and should be able to earn millions. But wouldn't it be, would it not be even more unfair to the people who like to watch him if you said that in the pursuit of some abstract ideal of equality, we're not going to let Muhammad Ali get more for one night's fight than the lowest man on the totem pole can get for a day's unskilled work on the docks? You could do that. But the result of that would be to deny people the opportunity to watch Muhammad Ali. I doubt very much that he would be willing to subject himself to the kind of fights he's gone through if he were to get the pay of an unskilled docker. Matthew, Milton Friedman is saying that inequality is a fact of life. Deal with it. You agree? 
Sure, I think there's always going to be some inequality in life. Uh, but, you know, there's an option between uh, do nothing with regarding Muhammad Ali and prevent him from fighting, and it's the system that we have now, which is where you have an income tax and people pay it. And even after taxes, many people are much richer than other people, but it allows us to get some revenue, to fund some programs, to take care of some problems, to create the infrastructure of society that we have, and to express some concern with the level of inequality and to try to make a society where you know, we have prosperity for everyone and where we have broadly shared economic growth. Uh, I think that's common sense and it's gone sort of a little bit missing in that dialogue. I, I think that what we need to do, we need to pay more attention to the rules of the game. Uh, that is, what creates some of the inequality that we see. That is, for example, in New York City, the, the price to own get a license to own and operate one taxi is $603,000. In Chicago, I believe it's something like close to $200,000. And, and many, many restrictions for people at the bottom of the economic ladder to get their feet on the bottom rungs of the economic ladder. Those are the kind of things that we should look, look, at, look at. What are the rules of the game and how can we change the rules Doesn't of the, the game to produce? control that too? No, no, it does. It's government. Of, it's of government. Of that is people who are on the inside, let's say the income and use example, the taxes in New York, the people who own these licenses, they're able to rig the economic game against the outsiders. That is, the insiders want to keep the outsiders out so the insiders can earn, charge higher prices and earn more income. And those are some of the systemic issues that we need to look at. To, just to pick up on Walter's point over here, Milton Friedman was making an extremely important point. The point that he was making was, how do you create the incentives in society to get the maximum possible wealth generated so that everybody can be better off? Now, if you, you know, uh, it's, it's all very good to say, well, you know, we can just sort of redistribute an X amount of wealth and, you know, still everybody will be prosperous. But mm -hmm. people don't become prosperous through redistribution. People become prosperous through creation of wealth. The minute you start to take away Muhammad Ali's incentive, uh, to you know, go and find and fight and makes a seven or eight million dollars or however much he makes, you take away the incentive of the producers to keep generating that wealth. That's what Milton Friedman is talking about over here. And so, so Walter is making an extremely important point. What we need to do is look at the regulations and the disincentives for wealth creation that keep people on the lower rungs of society at those rungs and deal with those rather than redistributing yeah. wealth. Well, I c you know. Th these are good points, but let's remember that uh, the people who are benefiting from the high prices for taxi cab licenses uh, isn't the government. Yeah. It's the entrepreneurs and the capitalists who run the taxi cab companies. But they're able yeah, to but so are we going to infringe on their freedom? But you they know, use the, the point government is that the government, the government has to figure out how to uh, arrange this so that there's a, a, as much opportunity for as many people as possible. There's a role for the government in regulating things and setting fair rules within a, uh, within a fairly open capitalist system. And, and um, maybe they haven't drawn the line in the right places here, but I don't think that's an argument you know, against the role of government. Milton Friedman also supported a negative income tax. He was thinking that would be an exchange for programs like welfare or food stamps and that kind of thing. But it's essentially the same thing. Do you think that's a contradiction to be in favor of a, a negative? I'm going to ask you that, John a negative income tax, which basically says at a certain point you stop paying in and you, you get more back. Um, well, I just, I, I think it needs to be all more on a practical level, right? If that produced enough revenue to run the important uh, functions of government, then, uh, you know, I suppose it's as good as anything else, depending on, you know, uh, the give and take. Can I, we have it, though. But Can the I point just, is you need revenue to do the important functions of government the argument today, ten, my life is spent in the actual give and take of trying to uh, argue these things in public policy debates and not in the relatively clean uh, academic arena where you can argue ideals and extreme I guess positions. My question is, it, was this a contradiction in ideology? Because basically it's 
it's a social welfare program by any other name. We, we have it now with well, earned income. Well, just to bring a little credits. context over here, mm -hmm. the reason Milton Friedman, uh, you know, create, uh, advocated the earned income tax credit scheme, which is, I think, what you're scheme. talking about, <laughs> was that he, he felt if there was going to be a welfare state, that was the most efficient way mm -hmm. to arrange it where the, you know, money that needed to go to the, to the recipients mm -hmm. of welfare would go directly to them. That's given that, that you're going to have a welfare that's state. That's given, if you, but he didn't advocate a welfare state. So that's mm -hmm. a very important yeah, difference to keep in right. mind. Going back to John's point over here, you know, I, I just hear you guys slipping between two things. It's one thing to tax tax people in order to function vital functions of the state, which are equally used by all. It is quite another thing to tax rich people to give that money to a certain subset of people, whether they are the poor or the talented or the untalented. Those are two very different things. I and feel that's like it's, the, it's the latter. It's switching. the latter that, that Milton Friedman was You know, but we, to. we hear here Muhammad Ali, he's so great. Wouldn't it be terrible if someone stopped him from boxing? And, and I agree, that would be terrible. Muhammad Ali was great, great fighter, great career. But of course, he, he was paying income taxes, very high income tax rates, as I recall, back when he was boxing. I mean, you were talking as if that would just destroy it and, and there, there would be no athletes, there Look, would be no you and, you and I can, you can You and I can sit and debate what is the optimal level of taxation after which the a tax becomes a disincentive to the producer. But there is such absolutely. a point. There, there, there is there such a point. Is. We have That's to right. agree. And the, so the point is that, you know, you, uh, you know if, uh, if you are a central planner and your infinite wisdom, you know exactly where that optimal point is. It's a different thing. Right, I don't believe I don't believe that kind of knowledge but is possible. This is what I'm saying I would saying much about rather, the switching, um, I would, No, I would much rather, you know, leave as much right. money as getting, possible, getting the idea of possible to, to people to use as they choose let, fit. Let me ask Walter, at what point does inequality, you know, income inequality, create, you know, just a, a huge social and political Problem. There's so much resentment on the bottom. What, what is the government's role then to, to to help mesh that? To help, you know. I, I I don't believe that government has a role whatsoever in doing in 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 getting rid of inequality. See see the point that you have to recognize is that there's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus giving the congressman the money. So the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is through first through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that dollar from some other American. Now, you should not confuse my disagreeing with the redistribution with my saying, well, you shouldn't take care of people who are in need. I believe in helping your fellow man by reaching into your own pockets to help your fellow man is praiseworthy and laudable reaching into somebody else's pockets to help your fellow man in need is despicable. And for the Christians among us, when God gave Moses the commandment, thou shalt not steal, he did not mean thou shalt not steal unless you got a majority vote in Congress. <laughs> and by the way, well, if, if you uh, have a majority <laughs> vote in Congress, it isn't stealing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Well, oh, no, my it's God. legalized stealing, but it is stealing. Uh, you, th to your point, there's resentment, uh, you know, uh, against the wealthy. Actually, there is not. The Pew Economic Mobility Project did a survey not too long ago, actually within the last six months. One percent of Americans put income inequality in their top ten issues. Yeah, so you, you know, ask them a, you more, know, a more pointed question about whether they resent somebody somebody's income versus theirs, it's, it's you they, can they do. You do amazing things with numbers and polls. Yes, but the, exactly. The, uh, but I, I actually Pew, don't disagree let me over here. Record, let, let me agree with Pew you for a second. Economic Mobility the, Project <laughs> is no well, bastion on no, right wing. No, I get it. It's all the way of question. Of stuff, but um, but the, uh, I actually was trying to agree with you there for a second. Uh, <laughs> that um, I don't think income inequality is resented that much by people or, or um, as long as there's fair opportunities on the front end, um, you know, that uh, people understand. I represent a lot of poor people for over 30 years. Most of them are just fine with the fact that they're not going to end up making as much money as someone else. If they feel like they haven't been blocked unfairly or that there haven't been conditions that have gotten in the way. Uh, they actually admire and love to follow the people with money and so forth, and that's an important part of American life, that you can strike it rich, right? People love that. Even poor people love that. All right. On to the next point by Milton Friedman. Not everyone will win, but Friedman believed that when a few win big, it ultimately helps the losers. That may sound like a contradiction, but I'll let Milton explain. Hey, 
charge is coming out now. Forty commission now. Highway, your players saying they have nothing. When the evening started, all of these players had about the same number of chips in front of them. But as the play progressed, they surely didn't. Some won, some lost. By the end of the evening, some of them will have big pile of chips, others will have small ones. They'll be big winners, they'll be big losers. In the name of equality, should the winnings be redistributed to the losers so that everybody ends up where he started? That would take all the fun out of the game. Even the losers wouldn't like that. They might like it tonight. But would they come back again to play if they knew that whatever happened, they'd end up exactly where they had started? But what does Las Vegas have to do with the real world? A great deal more than you might think. It's one very important part of our life in highly concentrated form. Every day, all of us are making decisions that involve gambles. Sometimes they're big gambles, as when we decide what occupation to pursue or whom to marry. More often, they're small gambles, as when we decide whether to cross the street against the traffic. But each time, the question is, who shall make the decision, we or somebody else? We can make the decision only if we bear the consequences. That's the economic system that has transformed our society in the past century and more. That's what gave the Henry Fords, the Thomas Alva Edisons, the Christian Barnards, the incentives to produce the miracles that have benefited us all. It's what gave other people the incentive to provide them with the finance for their ventures. Of course, there were lots of losers along the way. We don't remember their names, but remember they went in with their eyes open. They knew what they were doing. And win or lose, we society benefited from their willingness to take a chance. All right, Walter, interesting concept. Do losers benefit when a few people win big? Well, if it makes the pie bigger, <laughs> uh, it, they do. But I, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that, that winnings are a result. That is, you cannot judge a game by the results. For example, if you look at the poker players coming out of Las Vegas, some, are, some have won a lot of money, some have lost a lot of money. Now, by just knowing the result, you can't tell whether there's been poker fairness or poker justice. What you have to do, you have to say, we have to look at the process. We have to look at the rules of the game. And if the cards were dealt evenly from the top of the deck, if nobody was cheating, then any outcome is consistent with poker justice. And that's what we have to look at with the income distribution in our country. It is a result of something. So what people have to ask in advance, is the game being played fairly? Do, do, uh, does everybody have equal access to the market? And there are many, many restrictions that we mentioned tonight where people don't have equal access to the market. No, you mean you can buy your way in. I mean, which came first? You know, he uses the example of uh, Henry Ford. What about uh, Gates or Steve Jobs? I mean, Bill Gates. Well, and, and um, I actually don't have anything to quibble with with uh, what uh, Professor Williams just said. Um, you know, the, if everything is fair, then the outcomes are the outcomes, except to the extent that there are, uh, if some of the outcomes are sort of things that society doesn't want to have, like abject poverty or, you know, people in dire need. Um, but for the, for the, I think for the government to ensure fairness and so on, I think you need some uh, taxation in order to have revenue to do these functions. The functions of which create the conditions where a guy like G Gates can strike it rich by his own account or Warren Buffett. But, but presumably he had a leg up. He had investment money. He had something that a lot of people don't have. Same with the guy at the poker table. Well, if I come true. in with a million dollars and you come in with 10, my chances of winning more are greater than yours. And I think that's why you have things like small business loans and stuff. I mean, there's a the government attempting to level that playing field somewhat, but somebody's still got to take a risk. And I think that's okay. I mean, people, that, that's the kind of life we have here. Uh, the, the issue about government regulation and taxation is the one where it's not all or nothing. It's finding the right tipping point, and it's a thing where there's always going to be tension, and there's always going to be forces pulling one way and forces pulling the other. I mean, one of the questions is, should we do anything to protect losers? I mean, 
the vast majority of these people, of the people in the country who go bankrupt, they go bankrupt because of some catastrophic health situation. You know, do we want to be in a situation where we're seeing American families you know, lose everything they have because somebody has cancer? Should the government be doing, well, we are. We're trying to do a There's universal health care. Somebody you know, else I, I took an adventure with their money on Wall Street. I, I, I think we, we ought to do something. I mean, uh, Milton Friedman's talking about incentives and how you have to have incentives for people to take risks. And I think that's completely true. That's why you don't want to have a completely flat society. At the same time, people can take more risks and can be more entrepreneurial if they know that their downside losses are bounded to some extent. People know, if people know that they will be treated when they fall ill, that makes it a lot easier for them to go start their own business, something what? like that. If people know that, that some retirement benefits are going to exist as long as you, you know, participate in society, that lets you go, go do but things. You, can I just right? say one that, thing, you know, well, we no, actually one, just I, tried. I want to address the, one of the points about uh, government. Today, the federal government is close to 30% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. Between 1787 and the 1920s, the federal government is only 3% of the GDP, except during wartime. So one has to ask the question, how in the world did we go from a third world country in 1787 to the richest country in, in the 1920s without all the programs that you are saying are absolutely necessary? There were different programs at that time. There was a large scale government program to appropriate land in the West well, and no. hand it out to people. And it was a great oh, program. Well, it was hugely when the, when the, successful. When the, when the, and it built when exactly the poor, as When you the poor said. Irish were landing here in the 1840s, mm -hmm. fleeing the potato famine, mm -hmm. When they got off the ship, what's their food stamp program for them? They didn't and have if, food. There was and if different programs And if there's not at that a food time. stamp program, were, no, actually how there the were world not, they make it? They, what there were were there were no government programs at that time. What private. there were were there were private mutual aid societies that I'm actually sorry, no, were the most really that were all, economic resources that, that, that time took care of land. their own. They and took, the government was giving people free land. There was a large-scale program. There were land-grant colleges. There was a transcontinental railroad. Not there the was homes for that. Those the emerged much, much later. Do, much. You, do, do we have 18, any obligation? Between 1860 to 1960. That's when they when emerged. They, uh, there the was 1860s and 70s. I think P, P, your well, colleague, let me ask the question Peter. bluntly. This is what we were talking about. We are talking about gambling. Let's get to, back to that metaphor. Do, do uh, we have any obligation to protect losers? Well, two points over there. The gambling, the casino situation, there's a huge disanalogy. Because in a casino, you go and play a zero-sum game where there are winners and losers. In a free market economy, there are no, it's a win-win situation because people are trading with each other voluntarily and they, you are constantly increasing the pie with the result that even the poorest over a period of time do better. And this is, you know, there's, this is not a historically disputable fact. I mean, countries that have free markets have done much better by the lower rung of society than countries that don't have the free market. But, but I think as far as, you I know, as far I, as protecting the losers, can I just I make one more point? As far as protecting the losers, Matt's point that there should be protection for losers, that, no. that actually has been tried, and it was tried with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, where, uh, you know, the government essentially uh, 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 bailed out or, you know, gave a guarantee against bad subprime loans, and look at what we got. See, this when you is, have this a guarantee two against, two 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 when you have about. a guarantee okay. against losses, right. Right. you okay. encourage right. undue risk. Risk, and that's the problem. Mass. Okay, <laughs> so this is the thing, right? You talk about Henry Ford, talk about how America became such a wealthy society, and you know, this is the system, he says, that we've had for the past hundred whatever years. But the system that we had during that period was not a pure free market system. It was a mixed, regulated economy. It, it had progressive income taxes. It had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It had Social well, Security. Can, it had Medicare. It had Medicaid. But, now, obviously, no one is going to say that every single government program is a great idea. And I wouldn't. I would say that there's some programs we ought to have. But it, there's, it's very strange to look but, at the success of a regulated welfare state capitalism to point to that success and then use it as evidence but, but for how we should deregulate everything and eliminate. Walter, one, one of the things we have to look, in your city of Chicago, if you go to the poorest neighbors in Chicago, you'll see some people will have some nice cars, some nice cell phones, some nice clothing, but no nice schools. Why? How come not at least some nice schools? Well, it has to do with how cars, clothing, and cell phones are distributed through the market mechanism and how schools are distributed through the political mechanism. And th or through the government mechanism. And whenever goods are allocated 
through the government mechanism, you're going to find that the people at the bottom are going to be worse off than they otherwise would be. And the basic problems of poor people in our country, particularly poor black people, are represent the failure of government, whether it's in, in education, whether it's even just things as police protection. It is the failure of government. And so what a lot of people are saying, well, in light of this great failure of government, we're asking for more government. And I think, the, I, I think we, move, we should move here. in the opposite Sorry. direction. Sorry. I, think, I, th I think the argument would be for better government, do a better job. <laughs> it isn't necessarily more. I don't, I, don't, I don't think the answer to the school problem is to pull the government out of, out of schools. No, give the parents I, the money. I, yeah. Right, I think to system. have better schools is that, and to have try new things and so forth. Uh, I, I'm I'm fine with that, and there there are some nice schools in a number of Chicago neighborhoods, by the way, but uh, some of them are experimental. They're trying new things, but they're not pulling the government out of it. They're just loosening the right. reins and letting people try things. Final thought here tonight before we close. We wanted to give Milton Friedman the final word, and perhaps the defining ethos of his economic theories. Milton. The society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. All right, so let me repeat that. The society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. Final thoughts on that, Matthew? Well, you know, I don't think it's a real either or decision. I think that a free society is part of a society that treats all of its citizens equally and with equal concern for all of their interests. And uh, yeah, and I, I think it's, it's hard to, it sounds great, but <laughs> it's hard to know exactly what he means by it. I think a more productive juxtaposition is uh, the, the interest of the common good versus the interest of individual freedom. And there has to be a balancing point for those. Those are both valuable goals. There has to be a balancing point for it in order to maximize both of them consistent with an ordered society. You know, I think the historical record is extremely clear. Uh, I grew up in a country like India, which was socialistic for you know the most of the time that I was there, and the poor only got poorer in India. The you know the great gains uh, in eradicating poverty in India have come after it uh, liberalized its economy. 300 million people lifted out of poverty within like less than uh, two decades. So I think, yeah, the historical record here is extremely clear that uh, countries that put uh, uh, freedom ahead of equality get a great measure of both. I think he's absolutely right. And I think that, uh, that freedom is very, very important for economic growth and human welfare. And its main ingredient is limited government as our founders envisioned. Do you think America today has a great measure of both? Freedom uh, and equality. I think we're losing it. We On still have end? a whole lot, but we're losing it. Which end? We're losing it. To, that is, as, as Thomas Jefferson said, the natural tendency for government is for government to gain ground and for liberty to, uh, to yield. Anybody differ with that? America, freedom and equality. I think this is a free country. I think it's, yeah. uh, I think it's obvious to everyone. I think we're doing a good job with it, and we have the struggle with this tension between these two poles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we do a good job of finding the compromise points and trying to move the ball forward on both. Yeah, no, I, I am with Walter on this. I think we are losing it. We are tipping the balance much more uh, on the side of so-called equality. And the tragedy is going to be that we'll get less equality and we'll get less freedom. Through government programs? Is through government argument? programs, through universal health coverage, which is just going to keep uh, increasing the cost of health care to a point that it will become less affordable to more people, to just use one example. I wish we had more time to debate that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. You would drop all of these programs. You would drop them all, you would keep them. I mean, simple as that. Yeah, I agree with him about the taxis, though. The taxis? <laughs> yes. And the other areas of licensing yes. as well. well what about yes, education? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. that's another area where the government has a very heavy presence and the outcomes keep getting worse and worse and the achievement gap keeps getting greater and greater. So, you know, every, every industry in which the government is involved, whether it's healthcare or education, you see the gap between the, you know, the so-called winners and the so-called losers just increasing. I, you know, I'd rather see the focus on um, 
trying to figure out how to address big problems rather than on kind of ideological concerns about the way we go about That's it. That's what we're talking about. The big, the big problem that plagues every single kitchen table is this health care and the cost of health care and the cost of health insurance. We know what people are against, but they never talk about what, how you solve this problem. And, all right. uh, oh. <laughs> and we are not going to solve it right. right now either. All right. Thank you all for being here. My thanks to Walter Williams, Shika Delmia, Matthew Iglesias, and John Bowman. I'm Emily Rooney. Goodbye. Rochester, Detroit, you find a lot of Canadian patients in those hospitals. Major funding was provided by CME Group. For more than 160 years, through continuous innovation in trading and technology, CME Group products have provided businesses with the opportunity to manage risk amid the changing financial landscape. BP is dedicated to helping meet America's energy needs. Our investments support jobs across the country and reaffirm our commitment to the U.S. that began over a century ago. Additional funding was provided by John A. Gunn and Cynthia Fry Gunn, the Melvin S. Cohen Foundation, FedEx Corporation, the Ellie Phillips Family Foundation, and Corrett Foundation. <laughs>